I want to talk about calling people up. Calling and recalling. Remember those phone calls in Tennessee Williams or Arthur Miller or Hitchcock? Frantic, urgent calls on pay phones, on dodgy lines. Why are they so powerful? I just called to say I love you, Stevie Wonder. Matt Shepard was fond of that one. And I know because for several years in high school, I knew Matt. I speak of Matthew Shepard, who was murdered at the age of 21 for being who he was. Matt phoned his high school advisor just before he went out to be murdered. If you don't know the details, you'll find them all on the net. Brutal, horrifying. Matt's advisor called me up when it happened, but I was touring in the Far East and I missed the call. And when weeks later I did get the call, I told myself I could cope with that. In 17 years visiting this high school, I'd seen many students coming and going. Matt was just one of them. Or so I thought. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. That's the poet Francis Thompson. He ended up with the homeless under the arches at Charing Cross. That was quite a common sight till recently. Matt would have been fascinated to hear about that. Matt was interested in everything. He would talk to anyone and everyone. And I understand that because I do it sometimes. So why try to write about Matthew Shepard? By, by what right? Well, they've been a powerful theatre piece built on the testimonies of Wyoming folk who were affected by this tragedy. There have been a moving documentary film by a school friend. There were books, there was even, can you believe it, an oratorio. So why add? it all. Well, because I knew him, and I knew him in stressful times. Matt loved theatre, and I know theatre, because I might, with luck, be able to catch something of that bright, warm, surprising boy, because maybe, maybe enough time had now passed to lessen the danger of hurting people still living who were involved and who knew Matt. Because, like him, I'm gay, and every gay person has to pick a careful path in this world. Because Matt knew I knew when something terrible happened to him in Morocco, although I wasn't supposed to. Because amazingly, Matt found hope in me, so I learned later. Because he had a special gift for friendship. And because of that, I became close to his two best friends in school. Because he lived on in them, as he does in me, in all of us who knew him. Because it's 20 years since Matt was murdered. People have said good and true things about him, and they've guessed or lied or misrepresented him too. Because no one has all the facts, and some will always be disputed. Because Matt left so much unsaid. Because my life is long and his was short. I see his eyes, slightly a squint, boring through me, always in the front row when I gave a solo show on campus. Chaucer Pepys, Byron Browning, and many over the years. There's a poem by Browning's wife, Elizabeth. I used to quote it in class. Browning, a young stranger, knew her poems and he walked into her life and he rescued her and they fell in love and at the age of 40 he taught her to walk again and she had his child. All the world has changed, I think, since first I heard the footsteps of thy soul move still, oh still beside me. The footsteps of thy soul. Matt remembered those words. He quoted them when he came out to a 
high school friend. So it seems I had told him something that he needed to know. That it's possible to be somebody else's destiny and a happy one, even if you're gay. There was I, toiling a long while and moiling a long while, not knowing that you were drawing all times nearer like the stars of God. That's Peggy Mike in the Playboy of the Western World, full of wonder at the chance of finding love with a stranger, with the wild, the unlikely Christy Mann. I don't know if Matt ever heard that one from me, probably. I'm always quoting it. It's another way to say the same thing. Destiny walks towards us when we're not looking for it. As the story of Matt's savage death began to sweep America and then the world, I told myself that I could deal with it later. I fled him down the nights and down the days. But eventually I had to accept that somehow, sometime, I would have to call Matt up. But could I give words to my feelings publicly? I realised I cared, as we Brits might put it, rather deeply. Part of me hated the idea because I saw images of vultures tearing at carrion, dead meat. Part of me didn't want to add to the growing number of those claiming that they'd known Matthew Shepard. In Dickens' Christmas Carol, Scrooge is given a vision of the world after he has died. He sees people fighting over his possessions, tearing his clothes to rags. I didn't want to fight over Matt. Then again, if you patch rags together, you can make a quilt. And Matt had gone beyond the personal. He was becoming a legend, a symbol for the world, which was hungry for knowledge of him. So shouldn't that knowledge come from those who actually knew him? I read reports of his funeral and how heavily it snowed. And I remembered how it snowed when we rehearsed the three sisters in high school. I read about the friends and students dressed as angels who protected his friends and family from the hate demonstration on that day at the funeral. I fled him down the nights and down the days, but the time had come when I could flee no longer. Write about Matt, his advisor said. Come on, you do a good job. Well, would I? When I thought about it, yes, I had known men who had died or been murdered for being gay. There was a young director who took a man home and was killed by him. A World War II pilot slain by a young man he befriended. I knew him. A young stage manager who looked like Matt was thrown in the Thames to drown by a group of strangers. A concert pianist, about 21 like Matt, who threw himself off Beachy Head. So yes, maybe I did know a little about this. Maybe it was time to add to all those words about Matthew Wayne Shepherd. But how? Well, I've been writing all my life, mostly solo shows, finally doing one for a star for the West End of London. You know, everything that happens to us, good or bad, can be put to use. I found I've been writing all the time. I was, I am, a writer. So I approached the two girls I knew who were closest to him in high school, and as we talked and laughed and cried, I began to feel that they wanted me to dare to try to do this thing, to call up Matt. They knew where I stood in his life and in theirs. You know, putting on a play is an intimate thing. You become family. You have good days, bad days, and we had all been through that with Matt. Sitting in a fish restaurant in L.A., I marvelled as one of them conjured up the boy we'd known. With every word, every thought, Matt was coming back to us. And each night I sat alone in a beach house in Santa Monica, and I wrote it all up. I talked to him till it felt like I was talking with him. It was the same in Brussels with Matt's other great high school friend. Deep grief, oh yes, but laughter and exhilaration. I could see him dropping his books, touching his hair, dawdling, 
smiling that million dollar smile through a glint of metal on his teeth. After 17 years of visiting that school, maybe I could even dare to write dialogue for American students. I had the voices of his advisor and his friends. They shared his notes, letters and emails. Remember, it was a time before texts and mobiles had taken off. And I had his own writing in the school yearbook. And where I didn't have Matt's words, I had my memory of them. And once I started, I began to feel I was listening to him. That's presumptuous. It's questionable. I know that. But that's how it felt. And what I wrote began to write itself. And people ask, how do you write? Well, dreaming's one of the things you do. You don't think. You let the mind put surprising things together. For instance, shoes. I knew Matt was a careful dresser. I'd seen his bad reaction to the costume that I picked out for him, for the three sisters. Matt was fastidious. He loved shoes. When he was raped in Morocco, they took his money and his shoes. And when he was murdered in Wyoming, they took his $20 and his shoes. After the tragedy, his great friend used to look at the Van Gogh shoes in the Met Museum in New York, and she would think of Matt and his shoes. Then there was Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Matt loved that place. He spoke of it to his friends. He dreamt of meeting up with them in Jackson Hole. It happened that it was one of the two places, only two places, that I'd ever visited in the States. I spent a month at Jackson Hole once for a cultural festival. Matt and I didn't share this in life, but in a play we could. In The Three Sisters, Matt, as Andre said, you can sit in a bar in Moscow a whole hour and not be noticed. That must have been his experience more than once during the two years after he left school. It's the experience of any gay boy trying to find his way. Don't be too hard on him, darling, says Linda in Death of a Salesman. He's just a little boat looking for a harbour. Art can help us heal. Matt knew that. Matt would have said to me, go for it, Mr. Watts. So I wrote it. And I made a big mistake. I wrote with glee and sorrow. I lampooned caricatures. I revealed things that some people wouldn't want. I criticised a school that was doing a pretty good job of educating, inspiring. And in a way, I betrayed a lot of people. And with headlong gusto, I showed what I'd written to a few of them, and they were shocked. One, who had urged me to write about Matt in the first place, went quite silent. And for the first time I realised what a weapon words can be. How powerful. I put the play away and I decided that I was not the person to add anything to the Matthew Shepard story. Years passed and I changed and the world changed. The world became more violent, it seemed, more unkind. And one or two of those old friends said to me, hey, what's happening with that play? By that time, I got used to the joys and the disappointments of writing plays, and I made one crucial decision about that. I couldn't write about those still living. I must kaleidoscope them, mix them all up till they were amalgams, quite other than what they really were, but with many of the elements that I remembered on that campus when Matt was there, alive with us. And then I thought of all those great one-to-one -one encounters that you find in literature between the living and the dead. Dante, in his wonderful divine comedy, he meets Virgil, who was hundreds of years before him. Leo and Cordelia, and then the German and English soldiers meeting in death in strange meetings. I am the enemy who killed my friend. Hamlet, with his father's ghost, angels and ministers of grace defenders. And then I thought of my own encounters with my father. 
My father died eight months before I was born, in June 1940. I've often spoken to him, and so did my mother. I'm wearing his tie today, which he bought in 1932, when he was proudly becoming a little young pilot officer of the RAF. This is my dad's tie, nearly 90 years old. At Matt's funeral, one of his great friends asked, Matt, what shall I do? And in a way, he told her. She found someone who became a great friend there and then at the funeral. So you see, you can speak to those who aren't there. You must speak to them. Every play, every work of art is an invocation. It's a calling out. It's a calling to people. Arthur Miller said, a play is a love letter to the world, written in the hope of a favourable reply. So, I was now ready to call on Matthew Shepard the boy, warts and all, on his gentle, his loving self. So here goes Matt. It's Mr. Watts calling. Let's chew the cud, shall we? Are you laughing at my quaint British way with words? Do you remember, Matt, you goofed in an email. You said, us kids ain't got a two-cent vocabulary. Well, I have, Matt. I have a two-cent vocabulary. So, where do we start?